Good morning, and welcome to the Wyoming County Cultural Center at the Dietrich Theater. I am Dr. Marnie Heaster, Professor of Psychology at Misericordia, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for the Dietrich's free science on screen event, Bombshell, the Hedy Lamar story, and Women in STEM panel discussion. This morning's program is part of an initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. We would like to thank them for sponsoring the entire event from the movie to the popcorn and soda. Let's give them a hand. We would also like to thank our three panelists for being with us today. They are Dr. Heidi Manning, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Misericordia and a physicist, Paula Eckert, PNG uh, Mahupani plant engineer and labor relations leader, and Dr. Linda Auker, marine ecologist and assistant professor of biology at Misericordia. After the film, they will share with us their backgrounds in STEM, their reactions to the film, and will answer questions from me, the moderator, as well as from you about their experiences and their thoughts about women in STEM. So now, please sit back and relax as we watch the documentary, Bombshell, The Hedy Lamar Story. Uh, well, what a fascinating woman. Um, I, I, I personally really had no idea <laughs> um, that um, Hedy Lamar um, did all of the things that she did. So um, I hope you found it as fascinating as I did. We're gonna have a chance to have the panelists actually respond um, to the film, tell us about their reactions. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to begin this part of the program by um, t uh, talking a little bit about some statistics regarding uh, women in STEM fields. Um, so uh, from the National Science Foundation statistics 2018, uh, we know that about 28% uh, um, of the science and engineering workforce is female, um, even though obviously actually more than 50% of the workforce uh, in total is women. Um, so we are underrepresented um, in STEM fields. Uh, there is a higher share of women in certain STEM fields as compared to others. Uh, so there are more uh, women in the biological sciences and the social sciences. Um, and Linda is in the biological sciences, I am in the social sciences. Um, so uh, actually 40% uh, um, uh, uh, of people in uh, biological and social sciences are women. Uh, however, women are definitely underrepresented in the en engineering sciences, in computer and mathematical sciences, and in physical sciences. Uh, so, for example, in engineering, only 15% um, of engineers are women. Um, in computer and mathematical sciences, 26%. And if we uh, talk about education, so we can talk about K through 12 education and then also higher education. Um, so in K through 12, uh, first of all, we find few achievement differences between girls and boys in terms of their grades in math and science classes. And also uh, now, and this was not true you know, 20 years ago, um, but now um, equal numbers of female students take high level math and science classes, um, except for uh, computer science and engineering. We do see more disparities, however, emerging in higher education. So if we look at the percentages of women who graduate with bachelor's degrees um, in STEM fields, um, actually in biological sciences, it's pretty good, over 50%. But um, if we look at, for example, computer science, 18%, engineering, uh, 20%. Um, and then physical sciences, 39%. So there are greater disparities, gender disparities, in certain STEM fields as compared to others. And then the last thing that I would add is that the disparities are even greater for women of color. Okay. Um, and one thing I think maybe we can talk about a little bit with the panelists is the fact that things certainly have changed over time. 
Um, so the, dispa the disparities have lessened over time for women in STEM. However, there is still progress to be made. So I'd like to start actually by having each of our panelists uh, just talk a little bit more about you um, and your background in STEM, and we'll start with um, Linda Ocker. Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Linda Ocker. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a biology professor at Misericordia University. I'm in my second year teaching there. Uh, prior to Misericordia, I taught for five years at St. Lawrence University, which is in northern New York. And prior to that, I taught at four years at Siena College, which is near Albany, New York. Um, so what can I say about myself? I am an actual Pennsylvania native. I'm actually from Altoona. Uh, but as a very young child, my family would go to the beach. Uh, almost every year, we'd go to the Delaware Shore. And I became absolutely obsessed with collecting shells, with learning about all the different sea creatures. And by the time I was in eighth grade, I decided I wanted to be a marine biologist. And I really did not let go of that goal. <laughs> so um, I ended up getting my bachelor's in science in marine biology at Long Island University in New York. And then I took a little bit of time off after that, but then I went back to grad school um, and got a degree, a master's degree in oceanography at the University of Rhode Island. And then after, right after that, I went and got my PhD at the University of New Hampshire, um, in New Hampshire, obviously. But um, so, uh, and, that, and my PhD there was in zoology. So my main research focuses on invasive species. Um, I work with a lot of invertebrate animals and get to you know play with all the different animals that I enjoyed looking at when I was a kid but now I know a lot more about them and also a lot of new species that are showing up and understanding how those species impact uh, communities overall right so at Misericordia I teach marine biology I teach invertebrate zoology I will be teaching biostatistics soon um, I, am, I also teach non-majors and try to get them interested in science, understand science. So I teach a couple core courses in essential bio, and this semester I'm teaching an intro to marine bio class. In addition to that, I also mentor students in research. I have four research students right now who are doing various types of research um, kind of under the umbrella of marine invasive species. So... I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lynn. My name is Paula Eckert. Um, I am actually from the Binghamton, New York area, but I've lived in Pennsylvania most of my life, actually. I went to Penn State, and I'm a mechanical engineer from Penn State. I graduated 28 years ago, and I relocated to Tunkhannock. Um, if I could see people out there, I probably know some of you. I, I've been here forever. So um, my entire adult life is here. This is where my children call home. I work for Procter & Gamble as an engineer. Um, as Marnie said, I'm actually currently in a human resources broadening assignment. What's neat about P&G is you can take your engineering degree and do a wide variety of things. So I've spent time putting in um, lines. I've spent time building buildings. I've spent time building organizations, which is my favorite thing to do. Um, and I've spent a lot of time mentoring new young engineers, both male and female. Um, as well as our technicians. So I love working there. I love the juxtaposition of people and equipment and technology. Um, when I was absent for many summers from my children and they're like, we have one summer of 2016 that they say we didn't even have because I was at the plant so much putting in a line. Um, and at the end, we could go to Walmart and I was like, this is what mommy did all summer. So that was really neat. Um, there's been, there are products that exist the Under Jams products, for example, um, if any of you have children or grandchildren that wear the overnights that Procter & Gamble makes, those were developed at the Mahoopany site, and that was in the organization that I was in. So we developed them, we created the line, we put the line in. It was really, really great work. Um, the reason I chose engineering is not anything really illustrious. My dad was really clear that he was only paying for science, math, or engineering. And so um, I really, really, really wanted to be a journalist. And if I couldn't be that, I really, really wanted to be an architect. 
and he re you know, reinstated its math, science, or engineering. So I was like, fine. So I picked engineering, literally, almost in that sentence, um, because I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do the combination. And then by the time I was a junior and realized it was really, really hard, I have a physicist to my right, and I basically like, had to struggle through physics, so like, she is amazing. Um, when I finally was a junior and figured out how hard it was, I was like, well, I'm like halfway through, I'm gonna finish this now. And I'm so glad I did, because I love what I do at work. Absolutely love it, and I love being a working mom, and I love um, everything I've been able to do. Um, and my husband and I have produced exactly zero engineers, so three children, none of whom want to go into engineering at all. So, <laughs> and he is also an engineer, so I don't know how we've created that, but that is me. Thanks, Paula. Heidi. I'm Dr. Heidi Manning, and I am the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Misericordia University. I've been in that position for just over three years. Prior to moving here to uh, Dallas, where I live, I taught physics at a small liberal arts school in Minnesota for 20 years. And uh, as Marnie had mentioned, uh, I have my PhD in physics, and I, um, I got my PhD from the University of Minnesota and chose to go there um, because I got a really nice fellowship and I had the opportunity to do research before I even started graduate school. And it was a faculty member who said, oh, I got your name. Um, I'm working on this project that's going up on the space shuttle. Do you think you might be interested in coming to work on my project? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds really cool. Um, so I went and worked in his laboratory for five years. He was a fantastic thesis advisor. And when I got done, he said, you know, I've got some friends that are working out at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center just outside of Washington, D.C. You should see if he's got anything going on. And so I applied to his laboratory. Um, and I worked, they were uh, getting instruments ready to go to Saturn. They had two instruments. Um, right at a busy crunch time, and they needed lots of people to help, and so I happened to uh, have developed the one instrument for the space shuttle that was very, very similar to the ones that they were putting up on Saturn. Uh, so I worked out in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years at the Goddard Space Flight Center and kind of just stayed in touch with that research group as I uh, taught physics for a number of years. Um, I would go back and I did sabbaticals there, or spent summers in Washington, D.C., uh, working at Goddard Space Flight Center. That team and that research group has since put other instruments, um, there's the Curiosity rover on Mars, is one that I got to work with quite a bit, um, both in a summer research as well as a sabbatical. So that's kind of a little bit about my science background. So the first question I have actually is uh, about the film and your reactions to it. So would anyone like to take that question? Yes, Linda. Okay, I'll start. Um, one thing that one theme that I kept noticing over and over again was, you know, everybody putting Hetty into a box. This is what our expectations are of her. Um, this is what, you know, you should be, you're glamorous, just live that life, right, as I think it was in the Merv Griffin show where he had this idea of what her life must be like. Clearly, that wasn't too accurate. And I think, you know, overall, just that, that stress of, like, you know, I, I can be so much more than a pretty face. I am so much more than a pretty face. I have these ideas, but no one will take me seriously. And I think we saw the you know, the effect on her and her family over time, you know, when she wasn't allowed to be who she really was. Uh, something that I've noticed a lot with women in science is the relationship with their father. And there's been a lot of studies about uh, women who are going into science have uh, a supportive and strong father. And I saw that in in her mentioning, you know, her father encouraged her to do these things. Paula, you mentioned your father um, really encouraging that. And I think that's true. And that was one thing that really struck me as, a, as something that I've heard and seen and experienced myself in the past. Yeah, I think the thing I noticed most about in the film that I thought was the neatest and most interesting idea, and I talked to a lot of people about this, is that 
is the creative aspect of science. So it's so, you know, at least in engineering school, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rigor and sometimes you can lose the creativity. I thought it was great, you know, that she's such a creative mind and the best ideas come from creative minds, not just from people that can analyze everything. So I thought that was amazing and the fact that she wasn't trained, but she came up with this really great idea that worked so well. And if you think, like, you know, you read the thing on the end where it said it's part of your cell phone, it's part of your GPS, it's, it's like all, everything that we touch technology-wise today, even these radio frequency microphones, um, you know, that's like, I just thought that was really fascinating in a film. Thanks. So my next question is pretty general, but what does um, being a woman in STEM mean to you? I think for me, um, I mentioned like I didn't, you know, really my dad is the reason I was like, I knew where the free education was coming from, so I wanted to do what he asked me to do. But um, the output is that there is just weren't a lot, and there still aren't a lot of women and I, in STEM, and I like being that role model. And I also, to me, am so I, thankful every day that I landed at this time in history because there, you know, I've told my children this several times. My husband stays at home, which is kind of odd even now um, with our children. But, you know, like a hundred years ago, I don't know that this would have been an option. I wouldn't have, I maybe could have worked in a factory, but I wouldn't have been working in a factory putting the equipment in, more than likely. I wouldn't have gotten to design the stuff that I did. I wouldn't get to lead large organizations. It just wasn't an open, it wasn't an open opportunity. So I think that's what's cool about it is that we have the opportunity, and especially in the United States at this point in history, to have women be very successful in these kind of, kind of roles. And I think it's, I think that's remarkable. I think that's one of the best things about, the, about women in STEM. I think for me, as a, a woman in science, especially in higher education, um, I see myself as a role model and a representative and someone to encourage. Um, when I got my PhD, there was only 12% of the PhDs that you're given to women. And so um, it's increased a little bit. I think we're a little over 20% now. Um, but having experienced that and seeing the value of role models, or in my case, the lack thereof, as I was reflecting one time in graduate school that all through high school and all through college and all through undergraduate or graduate school, in my science and math teachers and professors. I had exactly one math professor who was a woman and zero science teachers that were women. And, you know, so I saw that as something that I could do to help change and to contribute is to be a role model for uh, young girls and encourage them to pursue science and math because we need more people and we need to hear different voices, we need to hear different ideas and to encourage that. I think that's what I see myself as a female scientist. I think for me, it's, you know, it's about being that role model for, for students. Like this is what a scientist looks like and having as many faces you know, behind the bench, out in the field or in front of the classroom right, that, that's doing science. Um, but I also think that opening the door for everyone to do science means you're opening the door for lots of new ideas, lots of experiences, which may not have been able to be heard before. So being a woman in science means I'm giving an additional voice, I'm giving additional experience that may not have been in the field before, a different perspective, right? Different set of ideas and the creativity, right, that we saw with Hedy Lamar. Like imagine, you know, how many, if, if we make science more inclusive, how many more ideas and how many more amazing things we can do, right? Um, I was wondering if any of you had a female mentor um, that guided you in your science career, um, and also, why do you th do you think it's particularly important 
um, for women to have female mentors? My master's advisor was a woman, um, Dr. Candace Oviet at the University of Rhode Island. She was one of the very few graduate students. She also graduated from uh, the Graduate School of Oceanography back, I think, in the late 60s. And she was one of the few female graduate students at the time. And I know that she was, you know, the fact that she accepted me into her lab and gave me an opportunity to explore kind of what my interests were and gave me a lot of options and kind of led me down the, the path of research that I find myself in now. I mean, I thought that was really important. And I think for her background of being a woman who, you know, was outnumbered in her class and recognizing, again, to keep that door open for people. I mean, I'm also a first-generation college student, right? So having that kind of open door for, you know, people from all different backgrounds to come in and actually, you know, experience science and do science is, is really important. I think having someone who experienced that themselves uh, is why I think a, a, a woman in science makes an excellent mentor for other women in science. I think my mentors were all male. I didn't have a lot of female mentors, but I think mentors can be, you know, anybody who is supportive. And I think of my uh, thesis advisor who was very supportive of me and had a number of women in his research lab that um, earned their degrees under his guidance and mentoring and, and being accepting of, of others, I think was really valuable for me. Yeah, I think I would agree. I'm like, I had to really think about women mentor. Most of my, obviously most of my classmates were men and most of my, uh, at that one point I had a lot of male mentors at work as well. There were, there are women at P&G, lots of them now, um, many, many more in management than we had when I started. Um, the ones that were there ahead of me um, very quickly reached out and interestingly enough, the biggest part of the mentorship at that time was how do you work career and family and to make that work. So it wasn't really as much the science aspect. You already like had ch checked the box that you got through that. It was like now how do you make working in a field that's typically, um, typically a male-dominated field in that there is somebody at home supporting so that you can be at work a lot of hours. That was really tricky to manage early on and so there were having women that I could look and see how they did it and they could explain this is what I did and this is support I, support I needed or however we handled it or however they handled it was really really important at least early in my career and it's it's a pay it forward thing for sure because I mentor lots and lots of women including my own daughter on that. <laughs> uh, as you pursued your interest in education in STEM, what reactions did you get from family members, peers, teachers? Uh, were there ways in which you were encouraged and were there ways in which you were discouraged? I know you said, Paula, that your father <laughs> really encouraged you. Um, but you know, for everybody else, were you generally encouraged and you, did you get any sort of negative reactions? I don't think I knew, I don't think my father knew what to do with me because I was like the first, I mean, my, my siblings are much older than I am. And so I showed up a lot later and decided I wanted to go to college. I want to be a scientist. I'm going to leave the state to go to college. And he was just like, I, I don't know how to deal with that. But he was also very encouraging at the same time. Like even as a young kid, you know, he, you know, he didn't really treat me any different than he did my older brother. I'd be out in the garage with him learning how like a car engine works. Um, we'd have, you know, when I got, went to college and, and was going through my PhD program, we'd have these really long philosophical conversations about life, the space, universe, everything. And so, I mean, he was very, he, he was very much a, a positive influence. Um, my teachers, I think overall, were also extremely positive. I had one I just remember I was in I was taking AP chemistry in high school and I had a was, I think one of the state universities like, I'm not going to name names but I had one on my my desk cuz I was visiting them that weekend and my chemistry came over 
chemistry teacher came over and said, oh, you can do so much better. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> like, okay, whatever. And I was like, fine. And so you're just kind of getting encouraged to kind of aim high, aim high as you can, um, and which I felt I was very fortunate to have. Yeah, I think I, uh, I think so, thinking about peers and uh, that in graduate school, I found uh, a lot of peers were supportive. Of course, we we're all trying to encourage each other, and it was a very supportive environment as you tried to I almost say endure to get through your doctorate. Um, in high school, I think my peers didn't quite really know what to do with me. They were supportive and friendly and fun, but you know, you did the science thing and that's okay. I was the only girl in my calculus class in, in high school and you know, I just got used to being different. And I think that's, I grew up with brothers. Um, I, I'm one of five children and I have three brothers that are all close in age to me. And uh, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd say I was a tomboy, but I always played football with my brothers because that's who was in the neighborhood and that's who you hung around with. And so growing up surrounded by boys and learning how to interact, if you will, with the boys, I think helped me as I encountered and worked with all these male uh, colleagues throughout my career. Um, do, do you feel you had equal opportunities um, to males in your, both in your education and in your careers? I can say I definitely have. So um, what's interesting about Procter & Gamble, it's kind of a gem. You don't necessarily know it's here because it's a little bit further that way. Um, and you can't smell it, which is great because it's a big paper plant. Most people don't want those in their backyard. Um, but I think that P&G, the company, has been always on the forefront of inclusiveness for, um, for women, for people of color, for um, all different nationalities and all different um, uh, makeups of like engineering and science. So um, I've always had, I just lucked out into a company. I mean, I, it was, I graduated in the early 90s. The internet wasn't invented. I, didn't, I did zero research on P&G. It was on the board at Penn State. My husband, my now husband, my boyfriend and I at the time were like, let's pick some, some place in Pennsylvania. Um, and that's how I like landed on P&G. It wasn't my first choice. I really wanted to work for Air Products. I don't even know why, because I hadn't interned with them or anything. Um, but I was very happy when I landed at P&G because it was so progressive. So I did work in a couple different other major companies um, in summers as, intern, as an intern. And uh, they were also progressive, but they were not quite as progressive. They were a little like I was the only um, woman and everybody looked like my dad. So it was really unnerving, actually, to go and like work with all the operators that didn't look like me, and none of them were my age. Um, when I went to P&G, suddenly there was like a group of people that looked like my age, and there were other women that were engineers, and then the operators were all similar. Um, at least there was like a diversity. So there was it was really very supportive. So like P&G is a great company to have worked for. A lot of my um, friends from college didn't land in similar companies, and they've had a little different experiences. But I've always had a great, personally, had a great experience. Great. I feel like I've had um, a lot of opportunities. Um, the fellowship that I had in graduate school, it was, uh, I think, one of the very nice things that I received, um, not only because my education was paid for, but Half of the fellowships went to women. It was the Department of Education. And so of my graduate school class, there was 12 of us that got this fellowship. Six of them were women and six were men, which made for a very positive experience because I had a lot of female uh, women in my cohort. And so that was really positive. Um, so I think that fellowship from the government, that um, Department of Education, provided good opportunities. And I think, you know, somebody said, well, you know, isn't it unfair you got that fellowship just because you're a woman? 
you know, you get comments like that. Um, you try and say that, no, these are the opportunities that are out there, and, you know, should you accept this fellowship just because you're a woman? And you would hope that there's a little bit more behind it, that you got the fellowship not just because of your gender. Um, but I think, I think be, in some sense, because I was different, it maybe provided some opportunities, you know, as an example of that fellowship. Related question, did, did you ever feel like you were treated differently in your career because of being a woman? Um, so a few times I, when I was a grad student, I had a um, male committee member for my thesis, and he was, I don't know, um, basically going through some rough patches and kept emailing me and kept emailing me. And, you know, and this was after I graduated and I was like kind of moving on to my next degree, next thing in my life. And it was really interesting because I don't know what was going on at home, but all I know his wife basically forbade him from ever talking to me again. Like, you know, I never responded to these emails that were like ridiculously long. And I thought to myself at this point, if I were a male student, right, A, would I be getting these long emotional emails from this person who's supposed to be my mentor and would I be forbidden from you know or would he be forbidden from talking to me which to me just like this is somebody in my field this is somebody who could be a valuable you know he could write letters of recommendation he could recommend me for different things I could ask his advice about stuff but no longer right so like there was a definite kind of a weirdness there and that actually ended up being the uh, the the thing that caused me to start thinking about women in science more. When I started my PhD uh, as a graduate student, I formed a graduate women in science program at the University of New Hampshire, which is still going on today. And that was kind of like the impetus for that because I realized, oh, we need to support each other because sometimes that support you think is there goes away. So... Um, when I was when I was younger in my internships, definitely that was when I worked with everybody looked like my dad, um, and they treated me like I was their daughter, which is which is fine. I was used to it. Um, I have, I'm I'm still very tiny anyway, so that does happen to me sometimes at work as well. Although I've been there long enough now, most people know. Okay, this is Paula, and she's been here forever, and she's definitely not 12. Um, and but that doesn't happen to anymore. But what is really interesting is. Um, how the my how I was treated differently story is that when I had my third child, who was our surprise child, I was supposed to come back to a role that's a really good role for when you're when you have brand new babies because it's not um, nearly as intense. And I had a very early on mentor who told me, you know what, Paula, don't ever be limited when, if you want to have a family and work in work in work in you know industry but you can't do everything at one time. That was great advice, and when I was out on maternity leave, uh, the plant manager, who was a, a male, called me, and he's like, I have this awesome operations assignment, and I totally forgot what this mentor had said, and I was like, oh, I'll totally take that, and then I proceeded to try to do that with a baby who didn't sleep for the first two and a half years. The other two did. I don't, the third one didn't. It was very, very, very difficult, and I know that I wasn't as good in that assignment as I could have been had I done it at a different time in my career. So it was interesting because, of course, they wanted to always offer all of the women the same opportunities as men, and that's great. And there are times when, and there are just times when you're making different decisions. It's no different than if, a, um, a, you know, I have men that I work with who they have family members that are sick or, or have, you know, cancer or something, and they need to step back and do different type of assignments, not the hardcore operations assignments. So it was interesting because in the name of doing the right thing for the, the company was trying to do the right thing and be supportive. It was actually not particularly supportive, and it was my own fault for not saying, you know what, this is a great assignment, and I want to take it in like two or three years when Hannah's a little bit older. I can, there's very, one very memorable moment where I felt like I was treated a little differently at a, at a science conference, and I was just getting, um, I was a bit younger, I was maybe two years into my teaching position, just working with um, a new piece of equipment, 
at a science conference, getting to know some people in this new area and this new subdiscipline. And I was talking to this guy, and he was kind of one of the top guys in the field and asking him about this. And, and we got into a conversation over the coffee break, and then we just kind of continued and didn't go into the science session, uh, but just continued the conversation because I was learning so much more about the field from him. And one of his colleagues, and you know, you described him very perfectly, the guy that looks like your dad who's you know, 30 years older than you, and you know, his, his colleague said, well, Bob, aren't you going to come into the session? He goes, why would I leave this? And I'm like, my next question is for us to think a little bit historically and compare that to the present. Um, and there are several of us here who are older. Linda, I would say, is younger. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about the progress um, over the past, you know, say, 30 years with respect to women in STEM. And then also, what challenges do you think still remain? Then working. When I went to some of the planetary science conferences, there was less than 10% of the people in the room were women. And if you go now, there's a much better representation. And so it's been very encouraging to see a lot more. Um, there was a lot more women in, involved in the planetary science. Um, there was one day with the Curiosity rover and to run the rover on Mars takes probably, probably 50 to 75 people to run it on a daily operations. And that group, there was enough women involved in the project at all different levels in all different areas that there was one day that every single role was play, uh, filled by a woman. And they made this very intentional effort to have women in every role. And so that was really nice to be a part of that. Um, so it wouldn't have been possible 30 years ago. I think we're, what I've seen that that's changed a lot is um, we, at the plant, so I also do recruiting for us, we don't have any problem finding women engineers. Um, when I started, there were, you, know, you had to really search them out on college campuses because there were, you know, six of them or whatever. I mean, I graduated from Penn State in mechanical engineering and there, I had two women that were friends that were in my study group and then, of course, all the rest were men. Not because There just weren't a lot of women in engineering even at an enormous school like Penn State. So we have a lot, it's definitely changed. We have no problem finding women engineers. Sometimes we have pe people that don't want to come to this area. That's a different problem statement, but the women engineers are there. And it's not even, it's not even like they had to think really hard about would I even want to go into this field because it's so difficult or be, like that's just not even, doesn't even play into their consciousness. Uh, which is interesting because it didn't, it didn't play into mine either, but I think that's because my dad was pretty clear on where the bar was. So it was great. I never really had to think, I never even had to think through that. It, like I never even thought through like, there's like no women in this program, or I'm having a hard time finding people to study with. Like I, it just never was a thing, really. Thanks, Paula. Do you have any thoughts, Linda? Well, in biology, I mean, I think since 1993, the biosciences has seen quite an increase in women in our field, and we're almost at that 50-50 range, not quite, almost there. But um, I did want to say, address the second half of your question is what still needs to be done, and I think, there's still a lot of room for improvement for you know, intersec intersectional populations like women of color, uh, BIPOC, you know, with, you know, indigenous uh, women. Uh, there's a lot of, of individuals that kind of fall into these intersections that we need to be better at addressing and finding ways to get, you know, get their talents uh, you know, in the lab, in the classroom, you know, as an engineer and all these different places. So that, I think that's where a lot of the work needs to be done right now. Thanks. And that kind of leads me to my next question, which is how can we best encourage and support girls and women, uh, and perhaps in particular uh, um, um, underrepresented um, groups of girls and women who are interested in STEM fields and careers? I How think, can we best encourage and support them? I think the, probably, I mean, one of the ways is to show, you know, there are women in this field and this is a totally viable option and you can do this, right? Because 
because girls tend to start out really strong. We, you know, we look at the grades and everything, but we see that girls tend to lose confidence at some point in math and sciences and might even be discouraged from going into those fields and we need to somehow find a way for that to not happen. Um, and you know, in my classroom, when I'm talking about research that people do, especially if it's a woman or a person of color, I just happen to put their picture up while I'm talking about the research they're doing. So the students get the message that, oh, science is not just you know, this particular group of people. Science is everybody. And just showing that, you know, without pointing it out, you know, and, but just saying that, yeah, there are people from all different backgrounds who do science. You should too, you're welcome here. So that's, that's one way that I've tried to do that in my class. I think also showcasing what, what can be done with the degree is really important. So I talk to a lot of, um, in fact, I was just on a conference on Thursday night with a group of the women engineers from Wilkes, and it was a Zoom conference, and they did a great job, and they were interviewing a bunch of different engineers, and I was actually, I love doing those kind of things because I was the only person that worked in manufacturing. All the other engineers worked in different industries. So there's such a wide variety of what you can do with the science degrees, all kinds of science degrees. And uh, I don't, most people don't know, like I didn't know. I, if I had known, if I could tell my 20 year old self, you really just get through this because you're gonna land into this job at the end that's so cool, I would've, it would've made, it would've made college a lot more fun. I also might've picked a different engineering discipline, but I definitely would've enjoyed it more because I would've known on the end I was gonna really enjoy what I was doing. Um, the, my first internship was working in, also uh, working in like, hardcore design and testing engineering. And after that experience, you know, I remember talking to my dad and I'm like, uh, I hate this. Like, I don't wanna do this for the rest of my life. And he's just like, go for another year. I'm sure you'll figure something out. And the next year I landed in manufacturing. Now it was defense manufacturing, so it was very different than consumer products. But that's when I realized I love working in this kind of environment. And I didn't know that that's what engineers did. Because I thought engineers did what I did the first year, and that's all they did. So I thought, I think it's, I think it's important for young women and young men in school to understand here's what the science disciplines can do, and they're not just like pigeonholed. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think showing examples is, and, and being an example is important. I think the best thing that we can do is to encourage the young girls especially in middle school, junior high, to stay with math and to study math. That's where they drop out. And as I talk to young girls, I keep saying the one thing you need to do is stay with math. It opens so many doors. And if you don't have the math background, opportunities are lost. Okay, then we will uh, wrap things up. So I would like to thank all of you for uh, being here for... Uh, being here for the film, but also staying for the uh, panel discussion. I think this has been a lot of fun for all of us. Um, and I would like to especially thank our panelists, uh, Linda, Paula, and Heidi, for sharing their experiences and um, thoughts with us today. Can we give them a round of applause, please? Thank you.